Okay, fabulous. Um, well, good morning, everybody. It's awesome to see everybody here again. I was just saying, um, as you're signing in, if you could put your name and agency in the chat, this way I just have a way to keep track of everything. That'd be really helpful. Um, also, in the last few sessions, there's been a fantastic conversation. So I'd love to keep that going. If any of you are, you know, this is the first session that you're joining, you can unmute yourself. Um, would love to see your face too if you want to put the video on and um, jump in with some conversation. There'll be a few kind of like natural pause moments throughout the session. So um, maybe, you know, throw your questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. I'm not actually going to be giving this presentation. My colleagues who I'll introduce in a second will be giving it. So if there's questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll, I'll monitor that. Um, but yeah, so I think that's all the housekeeping stuff. So anyway, Welcome. Thanks everybody for being here um, again for taking another hour and 10 minutes out of your day. So really, really appreciate it. Today um, we're going to be talking about the like critical importance of us as translators to our clients and homeowners of the FEMA appeal process. And so I know some of you all get um, your cases referred to you from maybe like Catholic charities or from other casework agencies. Um, and so you maybe don't interface like directly or immediately with the disaster survivors um, on their FEMA appeal and like can walk them through it. But I think there's still a lot of importance on being able to have that conversation with a client um, and just kind of like meet them where they're at. If they're talking about, you know, difficulty that they're having with FEMA or with their insurance company, this should provide you with tools and language to be able to like have that conversation with them and guide them in the right direction. So really whether or not you're directly like going through the application process with them, I think that it's really important that us as nonprofits that are in disaster recovery have the, the language and the vernacular to be able to support disaster survivors, whether that's directly or not. So um, what we're gonna get into today, it's a, it's a bit broad, but um, Myrna's done a really nice job of getting into some of the details of it. So there is, there's so much in this like FEMA appeal universe. And I don't know that we're gonna be able to cover everything today, but if you are interested in learning more, Myrna and Evan, um, their information and their contact information will be copied to you all when I send the follow-up email. And so again, this is all being recorded. I'll download the presentation along with some other resources like I've been doing the last few weeks and send that to you all along with um, Myrna and Evan's email addresses so, so that you can get in touch with them if you have more specific questions because I'm not the FEMA appeal expert. Um, so, okay, so with that, um, I will hand it over to Evan. Evan is going to give us um, a bit of a case study to kind of kick things off, but Myrna, I wanna just kind of also introduce them. So Evan has been, Evan, what is your title? Your title is, I'm sorry, FEMA Appeal? Program Manager. Program Manager, okay, thank you. Um, and Evan's been working with us in Southwest Louisiana where we kind of like beta tested um, a FEMA Appeals program that was a direct um, example of pre and post our like FEMA Appeal support, how much more funds could we get folks. Um, and so Evan's been doing this for a long time with SVP. So we're excited to have him here with us today. And then my colleague Myrna Chase is also with us. Um, Myrna previously worked for FEMA and a few other agencies. And so has just like a wealth of knowledge uh, in this realm. And so we're really excited for her to be able to share her knowledge and experience with us today too. So I will kick it over to Evan um, and then I'll mute myself and just monitor the chat. But Thanks, guys. Thanks, Angela. Um, hey, everyone. For folks that I have spoken to and and know, um, Toy, Ben, uh, Pastor Kevin, Olivia, it's it's good to see everyone on this call. Um, I'm really here to kind of kick us off and then hand it over to Myrna. But um, this work uh, matters. And it matters a lot for folks that um, have been impacted by the various disasters that our organizations have been involved with. Um, one example of, of this, the impact of how FEMA appeals impacts recovery 
is uh, a woman named Barbara Hartman. And on screen is actually her daughter, Deborah. Uh, Barbara's house was severely damaged by Hurricane Ida. And she was one of the first um, uh, survivors and residents that we met with uh, when we were out doing tarps and bucking out homes and removing debris in the days after Hurricane Ida. Her roof was severely damaged, um, causing rain to come into the inside, saturating all of her drywall, the inside, the paneling, ruining all of her personal property items and rendering the home uninhabitable. Barbara had uh, been living um, on her own with assistance from Deborah, who went over there every day to check in on her mom, lives right nearby. Um, her mom has some mobility issues as well as dealing with some dementia and really needed the assistance from Deborah on a day-to-day -day basis. But when Ida came in and damaged her home, uh, she was uninsured and um, had been living on a, on a fixed income for a number of years uh, in her, you know, what is a, what's a beautiful home when it's, um, as you can see in our, our after photo, but she applied for FEMA assistance. And uh, with the assistance of Deborah during the COVID-19 era, this is, you know, getting towards the end of this really difficult period with FEMA as they do remote inspections, as they do a lot of things from afar with smartphones on computers, calling folks that um, from various numbers and creating a number of difficulties for uh, folks like Miss Barbara, who, whose home was severely damaged by this type of storm. So a really positive thing that Barbara had was her daughter, Deborah, who vouched for her through this process. She was initially awarded about $9,600 from FEMA, which on its face seems like a good thing. She applied for FEMA assistance, uh, received a check of $9,600, done deal. Well, not exactly. She was, uh, Barbara was actually referred to the SBA without her knowledge. She might've received a, a mail correspondence from FEMA or received a call at some point, but for whatever reason, she didn't realize um, or take the, the steps that FEMA um, prescribes for survivors to go and actually um, file for or apply for an SBA loan. So she was not, she did not receive any assistance for her personal property. And one of the things that brought um, Miss Deborah to tears was the fact that um, so much of her mom's clothing and personal, personal items were damaged in the storm. Um, the beds, the furniture, um, and a number of, uh, you know, clothing items that she held really dear and um, knew were so important to her mom. But $9,600 was just a fraction of the total cost of this project. So as SVP was there mucking out the home, uh, treating the mold, removing debris, you're st she's still left with a bill for repairs of almost $50,000. So $9,600 on day one seems like a good thing, but what we knew was there was a lot of money left on the table. So um, working with Deborah, we advised that she um, help her mom apply for an SBA loan. She took out power of attorney to be able to talk to FEMA on her behalf. Um, we got a contractor to come by to do an estimate. We wrote up an appeal and Barbara was able to receive um, about $4,300 for her personal property, as well as an additional um, $14,300 uh, for her house for home repairs. So suddenly what seems like uh, an insurmountable or an insurmountable bill for repairs in her house seems a little bit uh, more of a possibility to get the repairs done and buy back some of those um, items that were damaged in her home and it brought her within reach for SVP. Um, we're able to fund the gap between what someone receives in FEMA assistance and the cost of repairs if it falls within you know, our funding window. But because her damages were so severe and she received so little from FEMA at the beginning, appealing brought her project within reach and she was able to have some assurance that some of the funds that she received for her contents she could put back towards the furniture and 
reestablishing um, a life inside of her home. So this, mat this work matters a lot. It brings projects within reach. And for some of the folks that I've spoken with um, on this call, this is definitely a challenge, but um, an opportunity for anyone who's involved to have some know-how through the FEMA process to realize that FEMA uh, wants disaster survivors to receive all of their eligible assistance. But there's a number of challenges along the way, including the technical difficulties, uh, issue, challenges caused by COVID-19, as well as um, some of the procedures that someone like Miss Barbara might not be uh, you know, completely aware of. So this work matters a lot and brings projects within reach. And just one example of the impact that an appeal can have on a family that, that really, really needs it. So we were able to rebuild her home and welcome her home uh, in mid-February. So a great success story and uh, a call to action for um, this type of work. And yeah. I'll leave it at that. And if there's any questions, I'll turn it over to Myrna, but I'll just pause for a sec. Okay. Well, thank you, Evan, for sharing that case study with us. Um, Evan's work along with the FEMA appeals team is really vital and important and continues each day to support the disaster recovery for survivors in Louisiana. So we thank you for that work, Evan. Okay. All right, so next we'll move on to uh, the agenda for the today. We're going to um, hit some points here and try to keep moving forward so that we can get to the end of this um, presentation and provide everyone with all the information they need to at least begin the, to think about, you know, the importance of the appeals process and how you can um, actually support your uh, people that you're in contact with disaster survivors to be able to be successful in this process. So first we'll, we'll look at the uh, FEMA individual assistance program. And that in, involves, a, and we're gonna do an overview, then we're gonna look at the FEMA assistance appeals process, navigating eligibility, how to structure a FEMA appeal letter. And then we'll, we'll all throughout, you can ask questions in the chat as Angela has stated, but we'll also, um, if you save some questions with the end, we'll, we hope to have some time at the end to also ask, answer any questions you have, okay? So basically, um, the FEMA appeals individual assistance um, and then how to structure the appeal letter, that's going to be a step-by-step -step guide for several appeals categories that we have. Uh, we have a home, appear, home repairs uh, category, then we have personal property. Next is the rental assistance, and then we move on to also moving in storage or other needs assistance categories that um, you can file an appeal for, okay? All right. So here is our, um, what we call like a menu of FEMA programs um, that provi is provided. Now, if what happens is the state that um, first declares their disaster, they then reach out to the federal government and these are the programs that FEMA will provide based on whichever one the state um, decides to uh, request. So we see we have here um, mass care emergency services, and that involves uh, sheltering and feeding and um, doing the search and rescue and those types of uh, needed resources to the state. Next, we have what we call IHP or Individuals and Households Program. And notice that there's two categories of disasters. There's either emergency declaration or there is a major disaster category. So it, it just depends on um, which category of, which level of disaster that, that, that is um, declared. We then move on to disaster case management. And that's where um, the federal government Agency FEMA will provide grant funds to the state to um, contract a disaster case management agency to assist the uh, disaster survivors in their recovery. 
We also have a crisis counseling assistance and training program through the FEMA um, individual assistance. That's a, another grant that's provided. Disaster legal services is another grant provided to the state so that, you know, that really supports a lot of the disaster survivors who need help with, you know, uh, managing their legal affairs after the disaster. And then you have disaster unemployment assistance. That's, um, you know, when people will say they're getting unemployment after a disaster is different from regular unemployment. So it's specific to if you're, you lost your job as a result of the disaster. And then we have volunteer agency coordination. So that's another, um, actually that's, that's gonna be um, through FEMA, their, their um, department is called interagency, what is it, IRC, interagency recovery coordination. So that's the volunteer agency coordination. And it also involves volunteer agency liaisons. So all of those are, are part of the FEMA individual assistance program, okay? But what we're gonna look at today specifically is individuals and households program. That's where the FEMA appeals program is, is the, the grants come out of that. And so when we do appeals, we're appealing for individuals and households program grants, okay? So I think this, um, this next slide here is important to give you a visual, and I love infographs, it gives you a visual of how the individuals and households program seek the delivery of these programs are sequenced. So in the minds of FEMA, the, the process of delivering disaster assistance begins with volunteer agencies, okay? And your insurance. So those are the first steps um, to the disaster survivor recovery is um, receiving the assistance from like say the Red Cross and the state, they provide sheltering and feeding in our first part there. Then there's you know clothing and medical needs. A lot of times um, you'll have the National Guard, you'll see the National Guard out there setting up points of distribution and food banks. So, by NGOs out there providing food. So that's the first line of disaster assistance that the disaster survivor will experience after a disaster. The next assistance is, is assumed to be your insurance. So if you're a renter or a homeowner, you have homeowner's insurance, rental insurance, flood insurance, that should be the next line of assistance. And, and then comes finally the federal assistance after those two have um, provided whatever services are available for those immediate needs after disaster. Any questions so far? Anything in the chat? Not yet? Okay, so I'll keep going. All right, so now we're into FEMA's federal assistance program. So we have the FEMA housing assistance, we have um, the other needs assistance. We have assistance that's based on your SBA eligibility. It's dependent on whether you um, are eligible to receive the SBA Small Business Administration loan, the disaster loans. But we're gonna focus on the FEMA housing assistance right now. That's That includes lodging expense reimbursement. So when the disaster survivor has to evacuate, especially when there's a mandatory evacuation, FEMA will reimburse the disaster survivors for their lodging expenses. There's also rental assistance so that if you're displaced from your home, you're no longer able to live there, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, you can um, be eligible for rental assistance through FEMA. There's repair for your home, if you're a homeowner and well, replacement assistance as well. FEMA also has what's called direct housing. That's um, where they will rent a, an apartment in advance of a multifamily housing unit and then place um, disaster survivors in those units if that's available, not always available um, in advance. So that's, that's something that they're working on. Also, um, transportable temporary housing units, we all know those as those uh, travel trailers, but they're now calling it TTHUs. 
Those can be placed on homeowners land if they own the, own the land themselves or someone in the household has ownership of that property, FEMA will consider placing that on their land. Um, there's direct lease uh, where a person can go um, and lease the place themselves, or there's the permanent housing construction, which is very rare um, for that to happen. That's gonna be in places where there's a very limited amount of housing stock available um, for people to be able to relocate to. Okay, so next, so that's our first line of uh, assistance from FEMA is going to be the FEMA housing assistance. Next comes the other needs assistance, and that involves um, actually funded by FEMA, the state, if it's a territory or tribal government, it's a cost share process, so FEMA pays some percentage of it and the state is responsible for the rest. And that, that supports um, disaster survivors who have funeral expenses as a result of the disaster, medical needs as a result, dental, like maybe they lost their dentures in the disaster. A lot of people don't realize that. If you lose your medical equipment or your dentures, that um, that's, you. I mean, you can just go straight to FEMA and request that assistance. And it's not, you don't have to um, get a loan from SBA or anything like that. It doesn't even have to be, um, covered by, unless you have funeral insurance, those kinds of things that will come first because the big thing here is no duplication of benefits, right? So if you have that benefit elsewhere, then you would need to go with that first, right? That sort of like falls under sort of the idea of insurance. Okay, so childcare, if you um, live here and now you have to relocate somewhere else and your childcare is, you know, where you used to live and it's more expensive where you're going, you can get assistance with paying that extra for childcare, moving in storage. If you, after the disaster, not before, but after the disaster, if you find that you have to pack up and whatever you have left and try to put it somewhere temporarily, that can be, um, you can re request that assistance from FEMA. The critical needs assistance that you hear a whole lot about after a disaster. Everybody's saying critical needs. Well, it's not always every disaster that critical needs is, um, is issued, but when it is, it's not just for everyone who registers. And a lot of people think it is, but it's only for if you have, what is it called? Critical needs. Now, after a disaster, everybody feels their needs are critical. That's just real. But the critical needs would have to be, you know, um, life and death type situations that you get that for you need money to buy a generator you need you know money to you know some medical situation something like that um and then also there's funds available to this is new to clean and remove mold to do um internal cleanup to some level if it will get you back to your home safely but not if the whole house is destroyed but if it's just a matter of doing some minimal muck and gut or some minimal cleaning up that you can get a grant for, then that's available. Okay, any questions? Yes, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't get my hand up fast enough. No problem. <laughs> um, two questions. Um, the first is about, I know you said it's very rare, but I'm wondering if you could tell us a little more about that permanent housing construction. Right. Our group is working in um, St. John and St. James parishes along the Mississippi River, and they're, um, it, it is very rural, and the housing stock is very limited, and we have one house I'm thinking of in particular that um, Ben went and assessed um, and talked to the fan, uh, Ben and Melissa, who are both on the call. They spoke with the homeowners this week, and it's it's a critical situation over there, so I'm wondering if that is something that could be explored for them. Right. Well, um, at this time, and when you think about the permanent housing construction mission for FEMA, you also have to think about the maximum grant allowance, okay? And that, grant, that maximum grant award, I should say, at this time is $37,900. Now, for Louisiana, I think it's 36, for, if you're talking about someone who registered last year. Registering, yes. So $36,000, that is what would be used to do this permanent housing construction. What permanent house could you build for $36,000? Okay. 
Nine. No, absolutely. That would be right. It would go into a. It would have to be matched with a lot of other funds. Match, right, right. So if someone, if the disaster survivor, pre um, presented other, you know, with with it not, it, it, so because the disaster assistance from FEMA is for emergency purposes, right? It would be emergency housing, even though it says permanent housing construction. That's going to be, um, and yes, rural areas would could potentially be considered, but it would also have to be um, a, an area where it's highly a lot of population. So a large population of people. So a lot of people are in this situation, right? Now we're going to consider the permanent housing construction because there's there's like maybe thousands of households the whole entire housing um, stock has been wiped out. Everyone would have to relocate somewhere else. That would totally shut down the whole town or whatever. So now I see. They, would, they would maybe construct some type of tiny houses or something, but not, you know, you're a whole house that you're gonna now third, you know, live in forever. It's just gonna be, even though it's, it's permanent construction, but it's still not gonna be, you know, full on three bedroom house and all that whole, just with whatever 36,000 plus some state funds probably come in there and add to it and maybe some donated funds, what have you. We're starting to see some like nicer, more permanent FEMA trailers. Is that what those are? But it's, I think those families are still getting, um, FEMA housing assistance. I think they're still getting home repair checks. So maybe that's not it. Well, if you're a homeowner, yes, you will get um, travel trailers placed on your land while you continue to repair. So that- it's Like nicer than travel trailers. They the mobile home units? Yes. Actually, yes. So they have the, the combination of travel trailers. It's about availability for, uh, from what my understanding is from the housing, housing um, division. It's about what's available. If those mobile home units are available at the time, then you'll see those rolling out and people getting those. But if, if there's other disasters that have those mobile home units in use, then most likely they're going to have to purchase a lot of travel trailers okay. um, to provide that temporary okay. um, transportable temporary housing unit um, to satisfy that. Okay. okay. Sorry. I, I'm just like this is like really big for us. I'm sorry, I'm taking up. Oh, no, 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 that's fine. It's, if you have the question, I'm sure other people do as well. And a lot of people want to find out about that permanent housing construction. Yeah. But it also, again, think about. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, what, what are the limits to that, right? Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah it's all about together all the different resources. Right, exactly. And I have a different question. About the, um, mm -hmm the um the next bucket of funding that you talked about the um ona fund mm -hmm. right um our experience with that so far has been that those funds are only accessible when people pay for them first and then apply for reimbursement around them like for example moving in storage it's like the homeowner has to have the ability to pay for that first and then they can apply to FEMA for reimbursements. Is that true or is there another way to do that? No, it's, from what I know, th these are funds that you, you would have to definitely acquire the moving and storage um, contract, but then they will, sup they will supplement, they will then pay the continuation of it. So you would have to have it first. In other words, they don't give you money to go find it from moving in storage, but if you if you um if you have it already, then they'll see your receipts. So yes, you need receipts for that. The funeral expenses, um, I know with COVID it was a reimbursement type situation. I'm not sure about since a lot of people don't really take FEMA up on that. That could be the reason why, because maybe you do have to pay it. But I think that it's there's always. Let me say this, okay? There's always an exception because every case, every situation is case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the person had the ability, mm -hmm. right, to pay it, then yes, they should. Right. But if it's someone who's saying we, we cannot pay for this funeral, mm -hmm. they, they just need to communicate that to FEMA mm -hmm. and, and they will consider that case. 
like yeah. medical equipment, I don't have the money to replace my dentures. Mm -hmm. Those types of things. Definitely child care as well. You have to go and acquire the child care and then they'll pay, you know, continue to pay it for you. Because everyone gets a certain amount of funds for something or the other, especially once you are eligible for something from FEMA, then you're eligible for owner because mm -hmm. it's based on your income, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mirna. Sure, sure. Okay, so we're ready to move on. Anyone else? Okay, so there's some other things here about SBA and so forth, and we'll be talking about those things going forward as well. But last, I want to say, since we're all in the voluntary agency um, arena, I believe, um, the last is unmet needs. And so it says FEMA will coordinate with whole community partners to address remaining unmet needs once an applicant has received all federal assistance for which they are eligible. So that's that volunteer agency liaison relationships that some of you may already have and, and the IRC coordination, all right? And that's really for long-term recovery as well. All right, let's move on. Let's go, all right. So, and we, I covered all of those things, yeah. Homeowners insurance is first, my clicks. Um, so most people don't get the maximum award so even though that 36,000 is out there, you know, these are emergency funds, you're just gonna get enough to satisfy your emergency, which is to get you back to safe, sanitary and functioning. That's always first, safe, sanitary and functioning. Um, this one talks about survivors are referred to SBA if they appear they may be able to get a low interest loan um, and then it's up to, SBA to either deny them and then they get back to the FEMA grant funds, right? And so, yeah. And then talking about SBA's decision, um, this becomes available after the survivor has received SBA decision. You go back to FEMA funds or the um, anything such as personal property, transportation, getting help with group flood insurance, you get those after you've um, applied for SBA and you've been denied. Okay, so let's move on. That's a lot. That's I have one more question, question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, this is good. Okay, cool. Um, there in the, um, where we were working right after the storm, there was a lot of mistrust around that SBA loan um, part of it. And that's when a lot of people just walked away from the FEMA application process. Yes. So I wonder if, and there was also kind of a lot of rumors like go ahead and apply for the loan and they're just going to they'll turn it into a grant that you won't have to pay back and it was just and and so just all kinds of stuff there so i wonder if right. Some what clarity on mean, what's the what's the, how does that actually work well the 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 truth of the matter is is that fema does not have the ability to check someone's income status right they use their federal partner sba to do the, the income um, credit check, to check your, to see if you, you're paying taxes, what your, and, and if what your tax um, level is, once they review your tax returns, SBA does all of that for FEMA. And if after all, and this is only for people who, when they first register with FEMA, do not indicate that they're on a fixed income, that they, you know, are on subsidies with the other subsidies for the federal government, such as SNAP or, you know, getting, um, you know, assistance, right? So these, so it, it, they, FEMA cannot determine unless you give them that information that you you don't qualify for any any anything such as a loan. They can only assume that maybe you will until SBA says. Otherwise, so SBA is going to be the determiner of whether you could possibly potentially be getting your assistance from a loan. So getting denied only can happen to, if you apply, right? So yes, it is important to apply for the SBA loan, get denied, which says obviously you can't afford you know, to be obligated to pay back a loan based on your income, not based on, you know, your feelings, but your income, it's already been established. And then you're sent back to FEMA because now you are eligible for free grant money, right? 
because all grants are income um, determined. And that's how it's determined. I think when you're able to explain to people, FEMA can't figure out your income. So they're asking SBA to do it. And if you're not qualified, they'll know they're not ever going to put a loan on you that you can't afford. So go ahead and fill out the application, let them deny you. And then you go right back to FEMA and get the money, the free money. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. It usually works. Once you break it down to people like that, it, it works. Like, okay. But no, grants being loans turned into grants. No, that doesn't happen. But what they, what they don't, well, you know, what the, 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 the miscommunication is, is that you go back to FEMA to get a grant, right? Okay. All right, so let's see what's next. So I think we, we really flushed all of this part out, the difference between FEMA and SBA, but I'll just, you know, again, just saying FEMA's the grant, SBA's the loan. FEMA's grant is need-based. The loan is income-based, see? Um, FEMA has a maximum, maximum award that's based on a, a consumer price index. So, but the loan, hey, you can go from 200,000 to, you know, uh, for uh, homeowners or renters get up to 40,000. So because, that's because FEMA's goal is not to get you back to pre-disaster conditions. It's to get you to safe, sanitary and functioning which means I have some place, not necessarily your home, but some place safe to, for me to live in my family, right? Somewhere that's functioning and somewhere that's sanitary. Now, if it's your home and you can maybe get some, min, those minimum grant funds to clean your home, gut it out, do some minor things to get it back to safe, sanitary and functioning, while you're renting or you know in a travel trailer what doing that work that's the minimum but totally rebuilding and repairing major repairs and such like that that's what SBA is for does that any does that make sense to people or does that bring clarity cuz people think that FEMA is a supplement to insurance and they state over and over that they are not a supplement to insurance. It's just emergency resources. And if you look at it that way, emergency resources are minimal and temporary, right? Okay, moving on. All right, let's work I have back. a question. I have a couple questions real quick, sorry. Okay, nice song. Um, hello. Hi. Um, so specifically for Louisiana, do you know which one of these FEMA programs is is active. Okay, going back to our programs. Yes, and I'm sorry, I, I chimed in a little bit late. I was on my cell phone. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they have, I think for, you know, we're talking about for Ida or for Laura? Ida, Rose, Ida. 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 Evan, Evan, right, there's everything is available. All of the FEMA programs are available, right? For Ida. That's individuals and households, rental assistance, the whole gamut of the individual assistance programs are available for Ida. Yeah, the only the only program that I think is still getting up and started is the disaster case management. Unless there's um, an, an organization that's been selected to do the disaster case management, that is what would come, you know, sometime after the disaster. Right. Um, but all the other assistance types are available. Okay, awesome. And then I have a follow-up question on the the thirty six thousand, the uh, replacing the structure. So uh, in some of those rural areas, we see a tremendous amount of mobile homes. So two questions. So if they have a single dwelling that's not a mobile home, and they qualified for the 36,000, could they then replace that with a mobile home instead yes. of doing, okay. Absolutely. And then, okay, and then second question, if they had a mobile home and it was completely destroyed, would the 36K factor into that to do a mobile home replacement? It ba it's based on the, um, the value of the mobile home. Okay. 
because but, that's but the answer is yes they could if they qualified for some funds to replace they could replace a mobile with a mobile oh no, absolutely absolutely okay. those funds are at the discretion of the recipient to determine what will get them back to what safe sanitary and functioning got you okay because a lot of places won't work on mobile homes that's the challenge is you know a lot of Builders, contractors. Yeah, see, that's the that whole what you do and your builders and your con. That's that's not the focus for FEMA. As far yeah. as the focus yeah. is, these funds are for the purpose of getting you back to safe, sanitary, and functioning. And if that means that you're going to use it for home repairs, fine. If it means that you're going to use it to buy a new mobile home, that's your choice. Okay. You know, but that's okay. where that ends. Now, then you can't say now, and I want more money to do other things. No, that's it. Right. Gotcha. That, because okay. the emergency is over. You have some place where you're safe, sanitary, and functioning. Sure. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And, and Evan, too. Okay. So I'm glad that was helpful. Yeah. All right. So, so let's, um, let's move on. Uh, let's see, I think something popped up for, for that. Yes, we talked about safe sanitary functioning and pre-storm conditions. So those, that's the difference between those funds, what they're, the purpose of them are. Okay, so let's look at the types of assistance now. Um, we're going to focus on these types here, home, home replacement assistance, um, personal property assistance, continuing temporary housing assistance. These are all the types of, get to that, the types of um, appeals SVP assists with uh, most often, okay? So let's see, another click here. We have right now that number 37,900 for this year's adjusted annual consumer price index. So. You know, um, depending on the FEMA assistance at this time, you have to be have an understanding of what the maximum is. And of course, like we said, most people don't get the maximum, but at least you know that if you appeal, you're going towards maybe possibly um, increasing your award amount. So that's why it's good to know what the maximum is. All right, so we'll move on. So you see there's, up there, there's others, but what we focus on is the home repairs, home replacement, personal property assistance, and continuing temporary housing assistance and rental assistance. All right. So there's no max for continued temporary housing assistance. Now that program, if you're not aware of it, it ties in with rental assistance. So when the disaster occurs and someone um, goes to register, they say to FEMA, I cannot live in my home, it is unlivable. That is critical. It is critical to make the statement to the people, the register registration specialists. That's all they're doing there. They're registering your information and you have to give that information. My home is unlivable. At that point, you will get rental assistance. First month's rent and deposit, deposit it into your account, okay? Once that happens and you do go and find somewhere to rent, you're then given the opportunity to fill out an application for continued temporary housing assistance that will then extend this rental first um, your your rental costs and your utility costs for the next up to 18 months, recertifying in a sense every three months with new receipts that you made payments to continue the temporary housing assistance. Does that make sense to everyone? So two things happen. Some people, when they register and they say, FEMA, I need help with my rental to um, rent somewhere to find somewhere to live, they, they either one, the survivor, it takes getting the letter in the mail for you to know what the money is for, okay? And if they don't get the letter by the time they get the money, sometimes the money comes before the letter comes or the letter is stopped up at the post office because your house is destroyed and now you're no longer receiving mail. Right, So you don't know what the money is for, but that's what it's for. And if you don't spend it on that, you spend it on something else and now you didn't rent anywhere, people think, well, they're gonna continue to get, you know, they're, gonna, they're looking now for help with apartment, but they already gave you that money. 
And that's critical for people to understand what is the money I'm receiving from FEMA for and using it for, because it's a grant, right? So grants must be used for what the purpose is. At any rate, that's something to think about. A lot of times people find themselves two, three months after disaster, not able to live with their family members anymore and seeking help because they heard other people got apartments with FEMA, but they took that rental assistance money and spent it on something else. Now they're looking to get, and there's the problem because you have to have spent the first month's rent and deposit money on that purpose. And now we'll continue consider you for continuing to pay. Um, rent somewhere else. So sometimes nonprofit organizations will have to find those people and give them, you know, since they didn't know, and we understand nobody really understands what happens after disaster. They didn't know that's what it was for. So you say, okay, we'll give you the first month's rent deposit for some place, you know, as a donation from a nonprofit. And then they can go back to FEMA and say, here's my receipts, pay for the rest. Okay. Does that help everyone to at least understand that part? Because that's a critical piece. Yeah, big time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on because um, our time. Marna, I have a question. Yes. And David, um, and you may have covered, I had to step out and come back in. All right. Recently, people were being paid in the hotel. And then last week, we started getting calls that FEMA was no longer going to pay the hotel. So then you know, most of these people didn't have a plan, you know, so now where do they go? Is there something I should be telling these people? We tell them, go ahead and find a place to rent. The problem is, you know, there may not be in, in the area, anything to rent. Um, Section eight housing was destroyed. So is there something else that I'm probably not tapping into? Okay, these are section eight people? No, they're just anybody. I don't okay. know. The Section 8 is a different situation, but if that if you need no, it's not the Section 8. All I'm saying okay. is all I'm saying is these people were in the hotel for like since the storm and now and they're they're Ida. Ida, right? Right, Ida. So now they're not paying any more hotel. And so yes, the they, don't have, they don't have a plan. I believe there was a TSA program. I understand it was the temp um, transitional sheltering assistance program last six months right. not a minute longer not a minute longer and but all, people, yeah they didn't plan you know there's no plan right. right and so but the thing because like evan was stating and and i think uh sonia or tori may have asked about disaster case management right right so when it takes so long and I, I know our time is i hope this is valuable because i don't know think we're going to get through this um whole thing but Here's when very valuable Okay, good. When disaster case management doesn't happen initially in a disaster to help and shepherd people through how to create a permanent housing plan for people that may never had even had to move in their life. You know what I'm saying? They don't know how to get an apartment and do all these things. So disaster case management always for every disaster that I've ever experienced, and it's been many, okay, in my past six years, it happens too late when they get that agency in place to now help people create a permanent housing plan. So that's where the nonprofit or agencies can come in and help people to say, okay, this six months of hotel is not going to last forever. It's going to end. So we need to stay, even though you're here, we know you're here. And this is TSA. This is not rental assistance because that's what people are getting confused. You, while they're in the TSA hotel, they should be getting, asking FEMA, finding an apartment somewhere else, not, it may have to be another county or something, right? right. But that, that's the, the time FEMA is giving you, six months to come up with a permanent housing plan. And they call them continuously. The caseworkers in FEMA call and say, have you, have you developed a permanent housing plan? Have you developed a permanent housing plan? I don't know, but, and people don't know what that means. You know what I'm saying? The average, what do, what do you mean by that? I can't find any place to live. So they say, they say no, or yes, or whatever. And so they, FEMA did stay in contact with these people because I mean, we, yes. we just, yeah. So you see, we, we weren't even aware they were there until we got phone calls on being kicked out. Right, because, so, pe because people are in trauma and they don't have case management to get them on their road to recovery. People, this is it. I, my home is destroyed. I'm in a hotel. I guess this is it. Someone needed to come along. FEMA does not do, they have a grant 
so that the state can hire disaster case managers to do this work, right? To right. get one-on-one -on -one with someone and walk them through, shepherd them through the process. So when it takes so long and it's happened over and over, if you look at different disasters, it happens over and over again, okay? That it comes to the six months, but you know, the state is also, it's a cost share on this TSA. So the state is also saying they gotta go. FEMA's paying a portion of that hotel, the state's paying the rest. Um, but by then, six months is enough time and most people are gone, but there's still gonna be some people who don't have those, what I call disaster recovery skill sets mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, get, make those day-to-day -day decisions to get them back to where they need to be in somewhere else. It might not be that house because you don't have the funds to replace it, but you do have to start thinking about where else can you be? So that's the thing. So what I would say, they can still get rental assistance. Okay. Yeah, and that's what we've been telling them. Go find a location and then, you know, we'll help you with the FEMA you know, will do it. They'll give yeah. them the first months because they didn't give it to them because they sent them to the hotel. If you go to the TSA hotel, you don't get the rental assistance right now because unless you ask for it, right? Or they may have gotten it and spent it and didn't know that's what it was for. Right. That's but actually they, usually They would have had to have filed for FEMA to begin with to be able to go back and ask. Well, they would. They would have Everyone filed. has to register. Yeah. If you're not registered, then you're, you're not part of the disaster, right? Right. right. Okay, that's good information. Thank you. Okay, so they need to get back on the phone. Find you know what I found one time is a place that has mobile homes. This uh, one guy he was just bringing in mobile homes after Hurricane Michael. Some you know I had a team and anyway, but we uh, so he had he was bringing in like a hundred mobile homes. I said all those people that were in the TSA hotels getting ready to get put out. I sent every last one of them over there to talk to that man, right? Get something in writing from him. Right. And then send that to FEMA. And that gave them some stay on the hotel. That gave them a, a reprieve on the hotel because they did have a permanent housing plan. They was just waiting for that mobile home to show up. Okay. Thank you. So FEMA's not going to throw everybody out on the street per se if they have a permanent housing plan. Now they're saying, oh, I just need another two weeks because I do have somewhere. Okay. What? Yeah, tell them to get something going and then give them some paper to FEMA, send it to FEMA that, oh, here's a lease I have. I'm just waiting for that apartment to come open. Okay. Okay. They'll say, all right, we'll give you another month. All right. But if you have nothing, does that help everyone? Thank you. Oh, boy. <laughs> all right. Our time is there, Angela. We're at 1026. What do I do? Um, what do we want to do? We still have a lot to go through. Um, do we want to break this out and do maybe like one or two more slides and then we could do part two next week instead? Because um, I don't want to rush through it and I, I know this is really valuable. So mm -hmm. we, we actually had to move next week's session anyway. So we could do it next Thursday at this time if that works for people. Part two would be great from Troy, okay. And I think these the questions you all have asked are, are um, urgent information that you need right now. So I'm not I'm not even you know concerned that, that you we hadn't got to what we can get to that. But if you have those types of questions, now you can take that information and help some people. I think that's probably what needed to be talked about anyway, right? Yeah. So so maybe let's go like another five minutes, five or ten mm -hmm. minutes, and then um, we'll wrap here. This is kind of a good you know stopping point. And yeah. then I'll set it up and send everybody out Zoom links and everything for next Thursday. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about the inspection part and then we'll stop there. We'll talk about appeals next, next time, okay? okay? All right, thanks everybody. Okay, all right. So, no, this was great. Okay, so um, here we have, um, so we have this, um, what appears to be a homeowner, a uh, disaster survivor. And so let's see what happens after you register for um, with FEMA. In this picture, you see this homeowner at, and apparently he's experienced a tornado hitting the home and destroying the roof, which also looks from the outside as if his personal property inside is also damaged. 
and there could be some structural damage as well as um, damage from wind driven rain either during the event or after the event. So most likely all of everything inside the home is damaged and needs to be replaced, right? So, let's go on to so what happens then, um, and especially since COVID has um, really caused uh, FEMA to have to reevaluate some of their processes. And one is the in-person inspection process. So FEMA has now adopted the system of inspecting homes and verifying damages in a virtual inspection, right? And because this virtual inspection happens over the phone and sometimes with FaceTime, um, this brings a challenge to people who are not, you know, tech savvy, have the ability to know how to use that smartphone in a way in which they can actually assist in this process of doing the inspection as far as a disaster survivor. So the in-person inspections would be, when, you know, if there was an in-person inspection, the in inspector would come and show their badge and what have you, and then walk through the, process, the, the property to conduct the inspection. But since it's now virtual, um, what they will do is ask these questions of the disaster survivor. And this is a critical piece here because this is where I believe um, the, the major loss of award amount happens because if it was me, you know, and it was my home and I had to describe the damage in my home over the phone to someone and that was going to be the impetus on whether I'm going to get $10,000 or $20,000, I would be at a loss. But here are some, at least some tips to give to disaster survivors of what they need to say because based on what FEMA is looking for. They have what they call degrees of damage, right? So you have these five levels. And if when the inspector asks you, okay, tell me about the damage to your home and you say, level, you say, you're not realizing you're saying level one damage, but this is what you say. I had minor damage, but I'm able to live in my home. Well, that's going to automatically disqualify you from getting any FEMA assistance because you're living in the home now and you had minor damage. This, the, 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 the disaster the, the financial assistance is for people who have emergency situations. If you just had maybe one broken window, you know, that's something that you can uh, repair on your own. But what happens is, um, okay, and then let's go to the next level and then I'll say. Um, level two, you would, you would need to say, I had damage to my home or personal property that requires a lot of repairs and I, and I may not be able to live in my home, okay? That will then, issue an, an um, in-person inspection or you will get an inspection. This Actually, this is when you're registering, you're saying this, I'm sorry. This is what you're saying when you register. You go to the DRC or you're calling over the phone or online. You're saying, oh, I just had minor or I had some, my, I don't think I can live there, right? They need to hear that. They need to hear that. If they don't hear that, then there will be no inspector coming out or there will no, not be an, a, a virtual inspection. Okay, and then the next level, of course, I had damage to my home and person property that requires major damages and I'm not able to live there. And then level four, my home was totally destroyed. That's when people get money. But see, when people register and they say, well, how come she got more than I got or this and that, we're on the same block because you said, I'm, yeah, I live, I'm living there. They ask, are you, where are you living? I'm living at my house. Well, FEMA has to, FEMA's emergency funds are for people who can't live at their house, right? And then people, um, you know, they get confused because they're like, well, why didn't I get help? My house is just damaged too because you're living there. And you cannot get um, repair um, funds to, for home repairs while you're living in the home. It, so you have to make a decision. And a lot of times, especially, you know, when people are very much emotionally attached to their home, it's been in their family for generations, they feel like leaving it is abandoning it, abandoning it. you know, they feel like I'm, if I leave here, I'm abandoning it, and then I don't know what's next. But you have to, they have to be reassured that there's other options like rental assistance or the TTHU, the um, 
putting the transportable temporary housing units on your property. But the, the, the thing is, is that when they register, the registration specialist is not a caseworker. So they're not gonna give them that information. They're just taking in information. They have a lot of people to register. So they're just registering your report of damages. So that's why this point is critical because if you don't get an inspector to your home, then you definitely are not gonna get any um, federal assistance, right? So that, that's a critical part there. Uh, let's see what's next. Okay, and we'll talk about why this matters and I probably did cover that. So of course, we know that um, our disaster survivors who are mostly uninsured and a low income, moderate income people, if they don't get this assistance from FEMA, um, it's sort of like a lot for a lot of people, it's their main source of, of beginning their disaster recovery for their home or replacing their personal property in their apartments or getting that rental assistance to find somewhere else to live. If they don't have um, this, these funds, that, then they're not going to be successful in their recovery process. And so that might be a lot of people who are staying in the hotels after six months, right? Those are the people that really need to get someone to help them maybe do an appeal. You know, maybe be, there was something that was said during the registration or subsequent conversations with FEMA where, and especially I love the Southern people. I, you know, I, I lived in the South many years in North Carolina. So I'm very acquainted with the Southern hospitality and, and Southern traditions. And I, I worked in Louisiana for Hurricane Laura Delta and the winter storms in Zeta for 10 months. And so I'm familiar with people in Louisiana and the South. And so the, the first thing is, I'm okay. I'm all right, right? And when you say that to the federal government, they say, good, next. You understand? So you're okay and all right when you are being, you know, that's your way of just communicating, you know, that's, that leads to you getting no awards, no funds, no help, no assistance, because you said they documented, they type in there. Applicants said they're all right. They are okay. They have no unmet needs is what you're saying. And that's not the case, is it? For most of these people. So having that disaster case management, well, that comes maybe eventually or maybe not at all for some disasters, but having the nonprofit organizations to help people to articulate their needs by just sitting with them and saying, let's write down what's going on. And the next time you talk to FEMA, here's the piece of paper that you're going to read straight off of there what it is that's going on with you so they know exactly what you need, right? and take that whole you know, um, barrier to their getting their recovery assistance out of the way. It's all miscommunications is what it is. So, okay. I hope that was something to um, you know, start the, and continue this conversation. Just like FEMA is sending the, when we, next week we'll talk about the letter that goes out and that's a whole nother, you know, uh, Pandora's box that that opens up for disaster survivors when they see the word ineligible, denied, when really it's just the beginning of the conversation. You, the grant that you applied for, you did not give me proof of ownership, but they don't, you know, they say it in certain terms, but once someone sees the word ineligible, it's a shutdown, you shut down emotionally, mentally, spiritually, post-traumatic stress disorder kicks in, you ball up that paint, that, that letter from FEMA, and you throw it in the trash, right? So we'll talk about that next week. So do we want to do a quick Q&A? See, I know there's a, there's some really great conversations and questions going on in the chat, but I mean, we have we can like do a Q&A and then wrap here. Um, and then I, I'll send out yeah notes for next Thursday. That works. Cool. What's going on in the chat? I haven't. I haven't been. I've been 
chatting it up myself. I don't know what's going on in the chat. <laughs> I'll leave that to Evan. Evan's been really very responsive here. Good, good. We're, we're tag team, Evan and I. <laughs> There's been some great questions about, um, I'm sorry, Toy, I'll just mention that there's been some great questions about um, really what can be boiled down to a short or medium term housing plan. And I just um, sent a response to Ben, who had a great question. Um, developing a short and medium term housing plan for someone as repairs are being done is paramount and one of the things that we do. So determining someone's eligible assistance uh, kind of uh, creates the path forward for that person. So if we find out um, that someone is, is eligible for TSA, they might have a hotel that's nearby that they're eligible for, maybe they didn't know about. If they've initially received rental assistance, they may very well have received uh, a form in the mail for them to recertify that assistance. How, you know, if they're not living at the home and that's what's listed as their mailing, it's, this might get lost in the shuffle, but that's where someone who is acting as case manager or as an advocate for that person, for that survivor is so important because when folks are moving around and uh, their housing um, situation is unstable, having someone who's thinking through these things uh, by their side is, is paramount to the process. Mm -hmm. um, if they've had damages to their home um, that are severe, but they haven't received for some reason a FEMA trailer, right? Um, it may be because they reported that their home was safe to occupy, even though they're living in a moldy home. And you and I both know that they shouldn't be living in that home because it's not safe or sanitary. So um, there's a number of things that uh, any one of us as an advocate for that survivor can do to move the path forward. but an important point is that it starts um, with that initial application and for subsequent disasters um, or storms, um, if, if uh, any of these organizations are involved, um, you're not gonna wood that there's not something that's as severe as Ida or Laura um, or as the tornadoes, um, but answering some of those questions initially uh, can help to solve or uh, address some of these issues on the front end right. rather than dealing with it on the back end, which is so often what we're doing and it's what we're doing now for Hurricane Ida six months after the storm. Could I add on to that? I just, I just think that there's a huge gap of at the FEMA end around like how this is set up and the realities of people living in like rural poverty. I just don't see the, there's just very little places for that to connect. And I'm, I'm just thinking back to those first like four weeks after the storm where myself and several other people kind of in our like grassroots network, we're trying to find hotels for people living in Convent, Louisiana who were, you know, without power for those first three weeks, um, you couldn't find a, first of all, trying to find a list of like designated FEMA hotels where FEMA would get invoiced directly for that hotel bill and not the person who doesn't have, didn't have any money to pay for a hotel in the first place. That mm -hmm. list was like outdated everywhere I called. They, the people working the front desk didn't know about it. And anyway, they were full. They were full. The closest hotel you could find was seven hours away, five to seven hours away. And so they have to have a car to get there, gas to get there, money for food when they get there because it's not doesn't it's not a kitchenette. And then um, it's just impossible. It was like an impossible solution. So those folks had to live in their moldy trailers that probably they should get a full thirty six thousand dollar award for. They didn't get a $36,000 award for it because they didn't answer the question right. So they put a roof on that trailer and it's, it should be totaled, you know? I mean, I'm thinking of three people right off the top of my head right now on that. It's just, I know this isn't Myrna. I know we all know this. I just wanted to like lay it out linearly <laughs> like that. It's like, there, I wish there was something we could also be doing to like try to help FEMA build a more robust program for people I know it's not just rural poverty. I know the issues change whenever we're dealing with um, uh, different communities, different places, but 
Oh, I just had to say it. I think, this, you know, like, the solution of non-congregant sheltering, okay, is a COVID solution, right? So they would have set up a shelter in that community, right? In some school, you know, gymnasium to get the people at least out of their homes. The, the goal is to get them into somewhere safe, sanitary, and function. And even if that's on the other side of the country, yeah, that's Alexandria meaningful. was the closest place we could get. Right, people. Alexandria, Louisiana. So they're, 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 the thing is, is we're providing an opportunity for you to be safe, sanitary, and functioning wherever that may be, right? For, and if it was not COVID, it would have been a shelter right in the community that Red Cross would have set up. Right, and shelters but, down here have such a bad reputation because of Katrina. Katrina, right. So they've gone away from that for two reasons then, that whole Katrina situation and because of COVID. Now we're doing non con Now, So that means you have to have these relationships with these hotels in advance, right? And so- I think they're moving, I'm aren't they moving away? Aren't they moving away from the, aren't they going, isn't the Red Cross going back to the congregant shelters? Or yes, have they after gone? COVID. Yes. No, yeah. I mean, this, again, it was only a creation of COVID, you know? Yeah. So, so when, but see the good thing is see, so that means you have all these people scattered everywhere and you can't even, well, Red Cross will be in those lobbies doing their case management, okay? Yeah. They will be on in those lobbies of those hotels working with people doing their case management. So that's a good thing, but you gotta get there to get the case management. So if you never go, then you're totally out of the loop of where the help is. So always shelters is where the help is, right? You, you evacuate, you go to, now there's all these people set up here to help you. They, the only thing, only um, Red Cross did start in, a, definitely, I remember in Delta, they were going out to people's homes after the Delta flooding and all of that happened, definitely in Alexandria and all that, I know for sure they were going door to door, trying to find these people. They were hunkering down in moldy homes. You know, to give them, offer them alternatives to sheltering. Um, and so that kind of work just has to continue. We have to all, it's just not a federal, state, or local, or nonprofit. We all have to collaboratively find these, these solutions to when this happens, what do we do then? This is the circumstance in rural communities. How do we combat those barriers that cause people to not have the information they need? And I think it's information sharing is big. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so I'll um, send out an invite for next Thursday. There's already a session planned for next Thursday, so I'll either, we'll shift one of them, but um, plan for um, an invite and email with you know more information here. So I think we'll stop there. Thank you everybody so much. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. Like, and I'll see if I can download some of these chat questions and answers too, just so that that's memorialized because I don't want to lose it. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll try to save that all. But yeah, thank you everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. This was so, so helpful. Good. Very helpful. Thank you all. I'm sorry I asked so many questions. It's just there right now. No, if you're asking those questions, Toy, I think lots of other people are having the same questions and just not asking them. So keep asking. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Pick my brain, pick Evan's brain, pick our brains. That's what we want. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Glad I, I'm glad I got to put a face with uh, Evan with your name. Good, good, to, good to meet you finally. <laughs> hey, likewise, Kevin. <laughs> All right. Okay, bye everyone. Evan, you gonna hang out for a second? Yeah, I can hang out for a minute. Okay, and, and Angela. Um, so in in the chat, you had mentioned, or I think it was you that mentioned. Um, so do you have something that fills that gap between, um, say, if it's a not a declared disaster? A, there's not going to be any federal FEMA money, um, and if it's a declared one, they usually come in six to eight months after.